All right, let's get started. Okay, so hi everybody. Today, uh, today's reading was a blog post that I wrote. Um, so the story of this blog post is that I was trying to explain Iris to John Howell, um, who works on, um, who also works on systems verification and is just trying to get into concurrency. Um, so I was trying to explain Iris, and uh, actually this is an example that John Howell came up with uh, to try to understand like what was going on. Um, and I figured that I would just formalize that proof and then this blog post came out of that formalization. Um, okay, so why are, but why are we talking about Iris? Uh, so Iris is, uh, we've seen some approaches to concurrency and Iris is very different from those approaches because it uses a program logic rather than um, using state machines and refinement. Um, so we wanted to show you this perspective on verifying concurrent code. Uh, we also really believe in Iris. We use Iris for our own research um, on concurrency and crash safety. Uh, and so we believe in it strongly enough that we think that you should also know about it. And we're using a blog post rather than a paper like all the other readings in this class, uh, simply because we found that the papers that have currently been published on Iris are a little bit too complicated and we wanted something that is very approachable or as approachable as possible. Uh, so the goals for this lecture uh, will be, I have three goals. So the first is to try to explain and help you understand what lock invariants are. So there's kind of an intuition that you probably have as a programmer for how locks work. Um, and lock invariants are a way of formalizing that intuition. I think it's a fairly natural way to understand what locks do. Um, and so we'll see how lock invariants work in the context of this proof. And that should help you get some sense of how they work uh, in general, how this is a way of thinking about what locks do. Uh, second big goal is understanding ghost variables. So we got some exposure to ghost variables in the Armada paper uh, where ghost variables show up in the spec code. So in Armada, the way that you introduce ghost variables is you write a whole program, you put some ghost variables in it, and then this forms your specification. And in Armada, of course, like intermediate programs um, are not specifications that are part of your proof. In those intermediate programs, you can also use ghost variables. Um, so ghost variables are both part of your proof as well as part of your specification. Ghost variables are a little bit different in Iris because they are not embedded into the program text. So in Armada, when you want to introduce a ghost variable, you literally write ghost variable as a declaration, um, and then you manipulate that in your code. In Iris, the ghost variables are only in the proof and this can make it a little bit harder to understand what's going on and how they correspond to the ghost variables in Armada. Um, but they're quite similar um, at a conceptual level. And finally, uh, one sort of minor goal, the tertiary goal, is being able to read these IPM goals. So why is this a goal? Well, part of this is just necessary to understand what's going on in anything in Iris. Uh, but also, if you kind of understand how the IPM goals, uh, this, this proof mode uh, works, that gives you some intuition for how spatial contexts work, um, for how work is preconditions work in Iris. And this gives you some backbone to start understanding the, the framework in general. Um, okay, so if you recall, actually, we, so now I'll move into this example. So of course this blog post is all about this example and the lecture will also be driven by this example, but I'll go into more detail than the blog post has. So if you recall, so one thing I want to do is sort of motivate what is this example and why is what we're doing hard here? So if you recall, actually, on the, I think the first or second day of class, uh, Nikolai gave this uh, little demo of um, a bank. It was actually very similar to this example. It's completely coincidence. Um, which consisted of two integers. Uh, I think they were nats before, but I'm going to make them integers here. Um, and we did some proof, uh, on the, of the form, uh, we did, we did a sort of invariant proof, although it was, um, we didn't literally call it an invariant, I think, uh, that said that the sum of the balances is preserved as you transfer things in this bank. So the way that that specification looked, because this is a purely functional bank, uh, you never modify this bank, you just return a new bank with transfer. 
uh, this was the specification that we had, this single equation. So we've now seen techniques in this class to upgrade the specification and code to something that's not purely functional and is instead sequential um, and imperative. So I'm going to keep this as similar as possible. So this is still going to be a bank record. We're going to relate the, the, but the sequential code is going to manipulate some pointer, which is going to uh, point to these two variables, this uh, amount one and amount two. And bank of L comma B is some predicate that says that L points to the two values in the bank. Uh, and now we can talk about implementing the bank as an imperative program rather than as um, this functional bank. So now we actually have state to manipulate. We might use separation logic to reason about this because we want those two pointers to be non-aliasing. Um, and we can prove that this sequential code simulates that imperative specif sorry, this imperative code simulates that functional specification of transfer. Um, and now we have a sequential specification and it's imperative, but it's, uh, it doesn't handle concurrency. So let's say we try to add concurrency to this example. What goes wrong? The problem is that this isn't really a reasonable specification. This isn't really a correct specification for transferring in the concurrent setting, because when we start running, what this says is that the bank currently has the balances inside B. Um, and then this transfer promises that afterward, the state of the bank is going to be exactly transfer of B comma N. But the problem with this is that that's not really how bank transfers work uh, with concurrency. Um, assuming that it was, the code was correct, it had mutexes and was atomic, um, it still wouldn't be correct because um, in reality, what if there are concurrent transfers while we're executing this code? Uh, then the state of the bank might not be B when this code actually runs. And afterward, it's certainly not going to be transfer of B comma N. The code is still correct in some sense. It can still be, we still might be able to prove that it's atomic, but we can't really prove that this code has the traditional meaning, that, sorry, this specification has the meaning we'd expect that it exactly transfer, it, it, it starts in a state where bank of L comma B is true and it ends up in bank of L transfer B then. So we need a more sophisticated specification. Uh, furthermore, I said, uh, in this hypothetical, I pretended like we had atomicity. Of course, we don't have atomicity. We have to prove that we're actually going to be atomic um, as far as callers are concerned. Um, and we don't even want to do this in a straightforward way where we just put a lock around the whole bank. We want to lock each account individually. In this example, locking each account individually doesn't buy us that much because there's only one possible transfer in the system. Um, but we want this proof to work for multiple accounts, of course. Like the, the point is not this sim single bank with two accounts. It's the idea is that you have many accounts. You should be able to transfer from one to the other. And transfers of independent sets of accounts, independent pairs of accounts, should be concurrent. There's no reason why those should have to conflict. Um, so, so there's two, there's two problems um, with making this concurrent, as I said. The first one is we can't share. The way I'm going to describe this here is we can't share this bank of L comma B. Multiple threads can't simultaneously know exactly what the state of the bank is if they're going to be transferring at the same time. And the second problem is uh, the proof techniques that we've seen so far for sequential programs don't have any way of dividing this proof up um, into something that's per account. So, so far, uh, sorry, this is a little bit too close. Um, so far, I want to just remind you of what techniques we've seen so far to approach this uh, in the context of Armada. So in Armada, um, the way that we could prove this example correct is we would want to say that the code of transfer uh, manipulates the bank atomically. So the, the code is the same code as is in the example. We would prove that it refines. So you can pronounce this uh, I, I, I'm writing a subset relation because what we want, what we're going to prove is that the traces of the code are a subset of the traces of the spec. The spec is going to be a piece of code 
that says that transfers are atomic. Um, it's going, so how do we say that? We're going to have two uh, accounts. This is the state of the system. And we'll write transfer as an atomic operation. And in Armada, uh, in the spec world, we can just make this atomic by fiat with this atomically statement. So it's going to say uh, account one, uh, we decremented by n. Uh, account two, we incremented by n. And these two things happen indivisibly. And if this is the code for transfer, then it's pretty reasonable that if you run this check balances uh, concurrently with transfer, uh, recall that check balances was a function which confirmed that the sum of the accounts was zero, then uh, we can prove that concurrent with transfer, uh, check balances are always going to return true. OK, so in this lecture, we're going to have a very different approach to this using Iris. Um, and first, I want to talk about why, why, would this, why would we not like this Armada specification? So one of the things about this Armada specification is it can only talk about we can only really do the proof for one particular implementation of the code. So we can prove that um, a transfer concurrently with a check balances uh, always returns true. The check balances always returns true if the code is literally uh, transfer uh, of the bank in parallel with check balances. If that's the code, then we can prove it refined uh, that this check balance is always returns true using a refinement proof. What about other transfers? We can't handle that. Uh, that requires another proof. We have to write a new program and write a new proof. So somehow there isn't enough modularity in this example. We're not proving that transfer independently of the other threads has the right behavior. Um, we're somehow having to do the entire proof all at once. And we don't know exactly what code we can write on top of the bank um, and have, it still, have the proof still go through. In Iris, we're going to do this proof in a more natural way. We're going to do this proof in a more modular way, where we just have specifications for transfer and check balances, and we'll compose those. Secondly, I think that the proof in Iris is going to be a little bit more natural than the proof that we see in Armada. So the proof in Armada is essentially going to consider pairwise operations, and it's going to do commutativity reasoning to make these two operations come together in any execution. In my opinion, this proof doesn't really give us much insight into what's going on. All it really does is it, it, it sort of just calculationally discovers that this is an atomic operation by considering all the possible operations of other threads. The iris proof is still, at the end of the day, going to cover all interactions between threads. But I think if you look at the invariance in iris, it'll give you some insight into why is the code correct? What is the meaning of the locks? OK. so. Um, what I'll do next is I'll launch into lock. I'll, I'll start explaining lock invariance. But before we go there, are there any questions? Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna launch into lock invariance. So I don't think the blog post actually goes spends too much time explaining what lock invariants are. Uh, so I want to give more intuition for those. So the intuition behind a lock invariant, sorry, ignore that this, uh, maybe I can hide it for a minute. OK. So the intuition for uh, lock invariants is that we think of a lock as protecting some resources, which is what we, and, that, and the, those resources are what we're going to call the lock invariant. Um, and the idea is that you can only access the resources by acquiring the lock. And when I say resources, I mean this in the iris sense, where resources include both points to facts as well as properties of those points to facts. So we can, uh, we'll, we'll see in our example that we don't just lock some data, we also lock um, a property that should hold of that data. 
That's why it's called a lock invariant and not just like uh, the contents of the lock. Uh, okay, so to explain lock invariance, what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain how locks work in Rust and in Go. And then I'll explain how uh, the implementation of locks in Rust is actually pretty close to lock invariance. And we can just do a little bit better um, in Iris than in Rust. Okay, I'm not going to expect that you already know what this Rust code means, so I'll explain it. Well, let's start with Go. So this is an example of, uh, okay, so this is a slightly different example than what we see on the blog post. In this example, I'm going to put the entire bank in one lock because the lock invariant is much clearer for this example than in the actual code. Uh, so in this case, the lock invariant is going to be really simple. We're going to always maintain that the two balances add up to zero. And furthermore, we're going to somehow protect these balances with the mutex. So we're only going to access these uh, two balance pointers uh, while we hold this mutex. So in Go, there's just a convention that we're going to write a comment that says m protects balance one and balance two. That is literally the best you can do in Go. Furthermore, we want an invariant to be true. So we're going to also write in our comment that balance one plus balance two uh, should equal zero. So that's the extent of lock invariance in Go. We're just going to declare as a convention that whenever you access balance one and balance two, you ought to do it under this mutex. In Rust, we can do a little bit better. So in Rust, what we first do is we declare a struct. Um, sorry, I can't select this thing. Um, we declare a struct that's going to contain the balances. And then we write this mutex of balances. What this means is that we're declaring to the Rust type system that a bank is a set of a pair of balances that are protected by a mutex. They're inside the mutex, like quite literally. Now, in Rust, the type system isn't so sophisticated that we can express that balance one plus balance two should be zero. So we have to write that as a comment. So that's a little bit too bad, but at least we now know that balance one and balance two um, are only going to be accessed with this mutex. And in fact, it's not just that, that they should be, it's actually impossible to access them without acquiring the mutex. So when you have a bank in Rust, or here we have a reference to a bank, so this is a shared bank. Um, think of it as a pointer to a bank. Um, the way that we access the balance is, is we call this b.lock method. What b.lock returns, you can think of it as returning a balances. Okay, so the type of uh, bowels, um, the type of this variable balance, bals, is balances. It's not exactly that. If you know Rust, you know that that's not true. Um, but it behaves like as if it were a, 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 um, a pair of balances. Um, you can ignore this unwrap. Um, that is there for technical reasons. And once we've acquired the lock, we now have mutable access to the contents of the bank. So we can modify them with this bals1 minus equals n, bals2 uh, plus equals n. Um, and then how do we unlock um, in Rust? So when you unlock the mutex, you should give up the balances, right? So when you unlock um, a mutex, you should no longer have access to the resources it protects. So Rust has this cool trick where instead of actually unlocking balances, instead of unlocking B, what we do is we just let bals go out of scope. So this curly brace means that um, this curly brace means that BALS is out of scope. As soon as BALS goes out of scope, Rust automatically unlocks um, the bank. So it tie these two things should be tied together, and this is how Rust ties them together. So that ensures that we have to acquire the lock in order to have access to balances. And as soon as we lose access to those balances, we unlock. OK, so that's actually pretty good. Uh, there are two cool properties, right? So that, let me just summarize what I said. So. Um, the balances are inside the mutex rather than just being adjacent to them. Um, and the upshot of this is that we can only access balances with the lock. Um, and we also saw that there was this fancy feature so that uh, we tie uh, having access to the contents of the mutex 
with unlocking, right? So uh, when we lose the contents, we unlock. Okay, so this actually makes a lot of progress towards understanding lock invariants in Iris. Uh, but in Iris, of course, we're not going to just put this, we're not just going to make this a comment, we're going to actually formalize this property. Again, to be clear, I'm, I'm explaining a slightly different example in which we have a single mutex to protect both balances. This is going to get more complicated once we want to make this finer grained. Um, so as you might expect, when we want finer grained concurrency, the proof is going to become more complicated. For now, we have very coarse grained concurrency where there's a single mutex and it just protects the entire bank. So the way that we're going to write this in Iris is, uh, first of all, I'm going to represent the data more like Go. So this B thing is uh, more like the Go struct. So B is going to have a mutex and two balances in Iris. We're not going to, the data's representation in Iris is not going to put the balances inside the mutex. Um, this is anyway not real, right? So like when you say mutex of balances, there's no sense in which the balances are actually inside the mutex. That, that's, that's just a logical notion. Um, it's not physically the case. Um, so we're going to associate a lock invariant with the mutex inside B. And that lock invariant is just going to be the entire property that we wanted to protect. So we're going to have the two current contents of the the, the values uh, at both balances. We're going to have maps two facts for both of these balance pointers. So recall that this maps two fact is it says what the value at b.val is, it says what value b.val one has if you dereference de it. And it also says that we have exclusive access to the balance. Um, now, this is inside a lock. So what that means is that in order to access b.val to read or write from it, you need to acquire this lock. And then crucially, we put in the um, invariant here that we were trying to protect. So what we were trying to guarantee is that the, the invariant that this bank is maintaining across transfers is that the sum of balances is always uh, the same. Sorry, I forgot this, what I mean is they equal 0. OK, so this is what the lock invariant says in Iris. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through a proof outline of what, uh, sorry, let me ask if there are questions here. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to start explaining uh, how this works in a proof. OK. I don't hear any questions, so I'm going to start writing this proof outline. So there are two interesting things, of course, right? There's what happens when you lock and what happens when you unlock. We're going to start by acquiring this lock. And this is going to be a lot like the a lot like what we ha what happened in Rust, where when we acquired the lock, we got access to this balance variable. Similarly, uh, it's not going to happen in the code level, but at a logical level, when we acquire the lock, we're going to get the thing inside the lock invariant. We're going to get that inside our context. Um, and we'll see this happen in an actual example shortly. And we learn at the same time that, um, oh, sorry, I this was supposed to be, these were supposed to be amounts. I mixed them up, sorry. Okay, so what I, what do I mean by this? Uh, so this is a whore triple for a lock, specialized to the case where the lock has this particular lock invariant. So what, what's going on is when you acquire the lock, you get all the things inside the lock invariant. Why does that make sense? Because only one thread can have the lock at any given time. Now we can execute a bunch of steps um, while we hold this lock. And the cool thing about Iris is that, uh, about the way these lock invariants work, is that 
while we're inside a critical section, we, get, we have essentially sequential reasoning uh, to manipulate whatever's inside the lock invariant. Again, before we explained this using movers. So before we explained this by saying, well, these things are logically atomic because if another thread were to run here, um, then we can move its actions somehow. So if some, um, if, if T2 runs here, then we can pretend like T2 ran uh, later or earlier at our choice um, because it can't be manipulating BAL1 and BAL2. So instead of doing any of that reasoning here, what we're instead going to do is we just get exclusive access to everything inside the lock invariant. And that automatically tells us that no other thread has access to BAL1 and BAL2. Um, so after this, uh, I think I'm not, OK, I'll write this out. But it, it's what you would expect. So this is like, this is just purely sequential reasoning. This is what happens when you write those two values. Uh, you modify both balances. Um, and finally, you should probably release this lock. So let's release the lock. Now, just uh, in unlocking is like the reverse of locking. So when you lock the bank, you get the lock invariant. That's uh, this this line here. And when you unlock the bank, you need to give back the lock invariant. And the reason for this, of course, is that after unlock, another thread might lock the bank, and they also expect for the lock invariant to be true. So you have to transfer all of these resources to some other thread. Um, otherwise, we, we can't have two threads that both think they own the lock at the same time. Now, in Rust, this all happened automatically. In Iris, it's not so straightforward. So first of all, we have to pick these two things, and we have to give them back to the lock. Uh, that's straightforward enough. but. The lock invariant also includes this uh, statement off to the side that amount one plus amount two equals zero. So in unlocking, we actually have an obligation to prove that amount one minus n, the new value of amount one, um, plus the second balance equals zero. Um, and then we are able to unlock. So unlike in Rust, where uh, we could unlock at any time for free, uh, as long as we gave up access to BALs. Here, we have to give up access to the two pointers and also prove that the lock invariant is maintained uh, because it has this extra uh, side condition about the amounts. OK, so that's all I'm going to say about this example with coarse grain concurrency. And now we'll move on to fine grain concurrency, um, as we saw in the actual blog post. Any questions about how lock invariants work? OK, cool. So let's do some fine grained concurrency. So instead of having one lock, let's try to have um, two locks. one per account. And what I really mean, of course, is an account uh, is a lock per account. Um, so oh, sorry, this is a very bad too. I'm going to fix that. Um, so I'm going to outline the proof uh, as we saw it in the blog post. And then I'm going to switch. To, I'm, I'm going to ask you guys to think about uh, how we would extend this to multiple uh, about multiple accounts. Uh, so this was the reading question. Uh, and that's kind of the, the point of this proof. This whole proof is that it easily extends to multiple accounts. Um, I didn't actually do that because it would make the code a lot more complicated. And a lot of the reasoning would not be related to concurrency. OK, so the way that we're going to move to two locks is, so first of all, let me explain why this is hard. So the reason why this is hard is because we need to rethink what we mean what invariant is causing the balances to add up to zero. The first thing I want to observe is that it is not actually literally the case that the balances have to add up to zero at all times. In fact, uh, and so, okay, so let me explain why that's the case. So 
in this example, there's only two accounts. And so this is not actually hard. Uh, the actually, yeah, let me, let me explain this. So even with two accounts, let's say a thread is in the middle of doing a transfer and when it does this, it's going to take three. It's going to take uh, two two steps, right? It's going to do a subtraction. Um, I'm going to write this. Uh, okay, I'm just going to write a minus here. So I'm going to write uh, val minus, and then I'm going to write val plus for the addition part. Okay, so in the middle here, the invariant appears to not be true, right? So Right here, the sum is definitely not zero, right? Because we subtracted from one balance and not the other. So what what was the specification that we really the specification that what was the specification that we had in mind? Intuitively, we want to think of the sum of the balances as always being zero. But what we really mean is if you were to observe the sum of the balances, you would see that they add up to zero. And by you, I mean if a thread observed it. Uh, if we were looking above and ignoring the threads, we will occasionally see states like this that don't sum to zero. But if we observe the system through its actual API and we execute check consistency, uh, then we'll observe that the sum of the balances is zero. So that already implies that the specification is not quite as simple as we've stated it here. It's instead a property about, uh, so, so the, way that we, the way that we make this argument formal is we're going to separate the physical balances, the actual state in the computer that I've shown here, from logical balances. And the sum of the logical balances is always going to be 0. And when you read the state of the system uh, with this check consistency function, you're always going to observe the logical balances. OK, so the flow is we add logical balances. And somehow we're going to have to connect them to the physical balances. I'll get back to that later. Then what do we need to do with these logical balances? We will guarantee logical balances sum to 0. OK, that's, that's what the transfer operation is going to guarantee. Um, it'll do that by delaying the updates to the logical balances. And then check consistency, uh, we're going to prove that check consistency observes the logical balances, not, um, not just some arbitrary values in the physical balances. And because it observes the logical balances and this property is true, um, that implies that we always see, or always see zero. Um, a sum of zero. Okay, so that's the logical flow of the proof. Uh, and now I'm going to talk about how we actually add those logical balances. What do those logical balances look like? So we're going to use go state to do this. And there was a lot of confusion or a lot of uh, people concerned about the fact that we have uh, both, when, when, as described in the blog post, the go state has this authoritative element as well as this uh, fragment. They're symmetric. This was very confusing to people. I completely agree this is confusing. Um, so here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make my ghost state not have an authoritative and a, I'm not going to use ghost state, which has an authoritative and a fragment. I'm just going to have ghost variables, which are single values. So I'm going to write them like this. Um, I'm going to give them names in the upper right-hand corner. And then I'm going to write a fraction in the lower right-hand corner. Uh, so this fraction is going to be a number, which is always going to be one or half. Uh, OK, and in the code, the way that we are we're going to write this, so I have a new version of this code that uses ghost var instead of uh, this. So in the, in the blog post, you saw things that look like this. Um, here, I'm going to write things that look like this. Sorry, one and x. So the meaning of this predicate is 
the meaning of this resource that I've written down here is the ghost variable whose name is gamma has the value x. That's the thing inside the box. And it also says that whoever, whichever thread has this fully owns the ghost variable because of the one. So if you can fully own it, you can also partially own it. And the way that that works is this full ownership is equal to two halves. So it can be split into two equal halves. In the blog post, basically what, what, what we were doing was instead of having this full ownership and these half ownerships, uh, we always had uh, the exclusive ownership, sorry, the, the fragment ownership and then the uh, off uh, ownership. But this is particularly confusing. So here I'm just going to use this fractional permission. Um, the fractional permission is not actually as simple as it is maybe not so simple, uh, but this is also a more general technique that's often used with concurrency. Um, the reason why this, uh, okay, so let me let me explain a little bit of the rules of like well, what do these fractional permissions mean? Um, there are two rules. There there are only there are only three proof rules that we're going to use. The first rule lets us create a ghost variable out of thin air. This is pretty sensible. We can create ghost variables because they don't actually affect the program at all. Just like in the number armada, we can introduce a ghost variable. So what this says is at any point, we can say there exists a new gamma and that gamma is uh, gonna be a fresh ghost variable that's never been used before. And we can own that ghost variable. We start, as we say here, fully owning the ghost variable. The second rule is what I've written here. So this is rule one, this is rule two. We can split ghost variables into two halves and we can also recombine them because this is inequality. Um, and the final rule that we'll need is uh, if we have two ghost variables, sorry, if we have two fractions of the same ghost variable, but they have different values, well, this isn't actually possible because the intuition that you should have for a ghost variable is when we do this allocation, when we, when we execute this uh, statement, there's only one ghost variable and it currently has value X. So if we have two fractions, they have to have the same underlying value. Um, oh, sorry, I lied. There's four rules because there's one more that I need to give you. So the fourth rule is we can change ghost variables. I'm sorry, I'll return back to this. I gave these out of order. Um, The, the fourth rule is that we can change ghost variables to whatever new value we want. Um, uh, and we can do this as long as we have full ownership over it. So this is what full ownership actually means. It means I have the right to change this ghost variable to any new value that I want. And why is this uh, safe to do? Well, it's because if I own the full ghost variable, that means no other thread owns any other part of it. That's how this fractional splitting works. If I split it up, then each of these halves can no longer be updated. But if I ever gather all of them back up, then I can update the ghost variable using this fourth rule here. And because uh, there's only one underlying ghost variable, if two different threads both know that the current value is uh, if one thread thinks that the value is x and the other thread thinks the value is y, x and y have to be equal. There's only one underlying value. They have to be the same thing. OK, so the idea is that we're going to create one of these ghost variables for each logical balance. So we're going to have, um, so we're going to separate out the balance one pointer, which will point to some balance. So this is going to be, this is the physical balance. And separately, we're going to have 
a ghost variable, which has some other value um, and uh, which has some other value that's going to be related to the balance. I'll get to that shortly. Um, and this is going to store the logical balance. So this is the logical, uh, this is the name of the variable that has the logical balance. It's gamma one. How are we going to tie these together? We're going to do this using the lock invariant. So the account inv, this is one of the first definitions that we saw in the proof, tells us how the logical and the physical balances are related. So, and actually, sorry, I'm gonna I'm gonna write I'm gonna write the whole is lock predicate, not just the account invariant. So we have a lock invariant for the mutex associated with the first account that says that if you acquire this lock, you get ownership of um, balref one. Um, it points to some balance and also um, the ghost variable has the same value and you get half ownership over it. I'll get to why this is half ownership in a second. Okay, so this is kind of where all the magic is happening. What we're saying is you can only modify the physical balance if you own the lock. Furthermore, we're saying if you own the lock, then the logical and the physical balances are equal because we put the same BAL1 inside both of these things. And finally, we're saying you also get half of the right to modify this logical balance when you acquire the lock. So how do you actually modify? You need to get the full ownership. The way that you get the full ownership is you also use an invariant, which was going to connect the two logical balances to each other. So the, the, the global invariant, the uh, bank inv in the code, has the other half ownership of each of these ghost variables. The reason why it needs to have some ownership is that we need to be able to talk about the two of them, the two uh, logical balances. And the way that we reference them is by owning some fraction of those variables. Because we, so now that we've mentioned these two variables, we've said their values are balance one and balance two, then as long as, then we can say that the two balances actually add up to zero. So this is the sense in which, this is the sense in which our spec is true. The logical balances always add up to zero. And if you acquire the lock for an account, then you learn that the two balances are, um, you learn that the physical balance equals the logical balance. And you can at any time open this invariant to learn that uh, this balance that you got, uh, this balance that you got out of the uh, lock invariant equals the balance that you got out of the invariant. Okay, that was a lot of symbols. Um, so, there's a lot of words. And so I'm going to try to make that a little bit more concrete by putting this um, in a more of a diagram. Um, and in the course of this diagram, also, uh, we'll see how, we'll see what it means to open up this invariant. Um, I think that'll be most clear in the code. Um, I'll get back to the code eventually. Um, but I do want to also show you pictorially what this proof is doing. Okay, so I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you an outline of how check consistency proves that it returns true, um, rather than proving that transfer is correct. Okay, so the code for, I'm going to write out the code for check consistency. Um, and while I'm doing this, are there any questions about this? This is probably the most confusing part. Can you go over why again, like we, we need things to have half ownership? Yeah, sure. Uh, okay, so what if 
What if we tried to lock the full ownership? Maybe that would be a good way to explain this. If we, okay, actually, so, so maybe one way, to, one way to see this is we're locking the ghost variable here because we don't want anybody to change the logical balance while we have the lock. That's the reason why we need some ownership here. Um, so the, the logical balance is protected by this mutex. Oh, I see. So because we have some ownership, nobody else could have full ownership. Yeah. So that's why that's why it's important that this be greater than zero. Okay. Cool. This has to be greater than zero simply because uh, we have to reference the the current value of the logical balance. So we need to be able to say like whatever its current value is, and whatever the current value of the other one is, they should add up to zero. Um, you can kind of think of these as not, like these halves, they don't really draw from other threads because at any time threads can access these half ownerships um, for temporarily uh, by using the invariant, right? So because this is an invariant, it's something that threads can access at any time as a logical step, right? With that, intuitively, this is always true. This invariant is always true. The lock invariant doesn't have this property. If you want to acquire this half ownership, you actually need to do some work. You need to acquire the lock. Um, okay. Yeah, and also like let me let me relate back to the blog post that instead of having two half ownerships, the only difference between this this diagram and the and the blog post is that in the blog post the half ownerships are expressed with this open circle and a closed circle, um, and, and they're different. Uh, but as many of you pointed out in your questions, why are they different? They're symmetric. The real reason is that this ghost variable thing that I'm using on these slides, um, it was not in Iris at the time. And I didn't want to prove that in the middle of the blog post because it's more complicated. OK, so what check consistency is going to do is it's going to acquire both locks, right? As we've said, you're not allowed to touch the balances without acquiring the locks. Uh, then it's going to read both balances. Um, I'm omitting the, I guess, OK, I'll put a star. So we dereference both balances. And we compare this to 0. And then we're going to unlock both of them. And we're going to return OK. So the goal is to prove that this line um, always sets OK equals true. So how does this proof work? I'm going to give a similar outline to above. Um, I'm going to give a similar, uh, similar style of outline um, where all I'm going to have to do is I'm going to tell you what happens across this step. So we acquire both locks. And by acquiring both locks, we get the lock invariance inside both of them. So we get a bunch of resources as a result of this. Uh, we get access to both balances. Um, and off to the side, we also get uh, both uh, of the logical accounts, but only half ownership. OK, so now we want to know that these two things, BAL1 plus BAL2, um, add up to 0. The way we do that is we open the invariant. Um, and opening the invariant is a lot like acquiring the lock in that when you open the invariant, you get the contents of you get the contents of the invariant. Um, so that means that opening the invariant gets us the resources uh, val one prime. We get half ownership of val one prime. Um, we get half ownership of val two prime. 
And we learn that Val won. Oh, uh, just as a side note, sometimes I put these uh, little lifting things. Um, the code has these symbols. Uh, sometimes in Iris papers, they omit these from the text, but I think that's kind of confusing. So I'm going to write them for the most part. This is just to say that this pure fact is true as well. Uh, pure meaning it's a, it's a clock fact, it's not an iris fact. Okay. So, uh, so as I was saying, we've opened the invariant, we get these resources. The difference between invariants and locks is that when you open an invariant, you have to close it right away. You can't take any program steps. You have to you have to, in one logical step, open and close the invariant. Uh, this is not technically true. You can keep them open for one step exactly. Uh, but you need to close the invariant because other threads can rely on the, rely on the invariant being true at all intermediate points of execution. Uh, unlike locks. Uh, locks, we only rely on them, lock invariants, we only rely on being true when someone actually acquires the lock. Uh, if we go up to this example way back, um, during this critical section right here, the lock invariant is not actually true. But this isn't a problem at all because other threads don't have the lock, so they don't observe this inconsistency. It's kind of the point of locks. Invariants, by contrast, are actually designed to be true at all intermediate points. So we can't violate them even temp we can't we can't violate them even temporarily. But we can violate them in a logical way, right? So we or we can we can still have access to their contents, just not for too long. So what we do is uh, so what I'm gonna do here is you can kind of think of each of these lines as being logical steps. They're not physical steps, these are still, but these are gonna be steps in the proof. So the step that we took here is we opened the invariant. Then the reasoning that we're going to do is, uh, if you recall, I said this uh, third rule uh, says, if we have two ownerships of the same ghost variable, then we know that their values are equal. So here we have exactly that situation. Um, this and this are the same ghost variable. And therefore we know, we can conclude that BAL1 uh, prime is just the same thing as BAL1. So recall what I said earlier that we need to know that the logical state um, of the system is, the, the logical values of the balances line up with the physical ones. This is how we're gonna do that. So we know that these two are equal um, but we need to now learn that the two logical balances, the two logical views that we have are all, also line up. So we do that for balance one, we do that for balance two. And now if we see this statement suddenly is useful to us. It now says that balance one plus balance two equals zero. And that's exactly what we wanted to know, right? So we're adding up these two balances. Uh, we know that this value is balance one uh, because of this points two fact. Uh, we know that this is balance two. We know that these equal bal one prime and this and bal two prime respectively. Um, sorry, bal two prime. And then the sum of these two things is zero. And that tells us that this OK is always going to be true. And that actually completes the proof of uh, this little snippet of code, which is uh, the code for check consistency. OK, uh, so I'm going, to spend a, I'm going to spend a little bit of time explaining how this works in the code, just so that you can relate what you've seen here uh, to what's actually going on in Iris. And, and the blog post is also more code heavy than this. Um, any questions before I switch to looking at code? Okay, I will do a new share.
Okay, so I'm gonna just do, so I illustrated the check consistency on paper. What I'm gonna do here is go over the transfer code instead, which has a little bit more interesting updates. So uh, I've fast forwarded to the part of the proof where, uh, oh, sorry, I went a little bit too far. So this is the part of the proof where all we've done is uh, acquire the locks. So this is the same as the first state that we saw uh, for check consistency. Those, those, both of those uh, pieces of code start by acquiring both locks. Okay, so how do we read everything that's going on in this right-hand side? So if you remember from the separation logic lecture, this stuff above the line, that's just a normal clock context. So this is what you're used to seeing in your labs. But all the interesting stuff, you can see that there's no interesting, there's no facts here. There's no equalities, there's no abstraction relations. All the interesting stuff is happening inside the iris proof mode. The iris proof mode is divided into three sections. This is the persistent context, and this is the spatial context. These are all the separation logic facts that you have. The persistent context, these things, are special because these things can be freely duplicated. So this fact, you can't duplicate. If you, if you know that balref points to bal1, you can't share that with other threads. Uh, only one thread can know this fact at the same, at any given time. Is lock, on the other hand, all the threads are allowed to know that the lock invariant is a count inv, right? You can free, all the threads can share this fact. Note that like, this is lock doesn't mean that I have the lock. It just means there is a lock. Um, it, what it really means is we've agreed that the lock protects this and not some other fact. Okay, so then we have the persistent context and we can see that it has both of our lock invariants. You can ignore these locked things that just says I have the lock. Um, we need that for technical reasons. But you can see that the lock, we got the lock invariant. It says that we have balref points to bal1. This thing is the, the dotted box. Or, um, it is for the variable gamma dot one. Um, it's only half ownership. And it says that its value is bal1. As we expect, these two are the same value. Similarly for the second account. And what this WP says is we're proving, we need to prove the remainder of the code correct. This is the code that actually does the transfer and then releases the locks. So as I said, the once we've acquired the locks, we have totally sequential reasoning within the body of, uh, of that function. So actually, Iris has good tactics to make this pretty automatic. So I don't really have to think about this too much. I just execute all these. I just execute WP load and WP store repeatedly. Um, so you can see where that brought us. Uh, we were able to update the two physical balances to subtract from the first and add to the second. OK, so now something interesting is happening here. We have ended up in a situation where the physical balance is different from the logical balance. Um, now, recall that I said the lock, the lock invariant is that these two things are equal. But we're allowed to break the lock invariant temporarily um, during the critical section. So the lock invariant is currently broken. Before we can release the locks, we have to restore the lock invariants. How are we going to do that? Well, we're going to update these ghost variables so that they correctly reflect the current physical balances. Uh, we're going to basically subtract one, sorry, subtract amount from this ghost variable. OK, so there's a bunch of work we have to do to do that. Some of this stuff is not really important, so I'm going to skip over it. Um, what is important is that we only have half ownership of this ghost variable. So going to Julian's question, like it's a little bit of a problem that we only have half ownership because we want to update this balance. It turns out it's not really a problem because we can open the invariant. So this tactic, uh, I, and by the way, I'm, I'm mostly going to just ignore everything on the left-hand side for the purposes of this explanation. Um, I'm just going to explain intuitively what I'm doing on the right-hand side. Uh, OK, so I turned on this coloring. That, so this green stuff is all the new stuff that appeared because I opened the invariant. When I open the invariant, I get access to three things. Um, I get access to the other half of both ghost variables. Um, 
as I saw, as we saw on the paper on, on paper, we don't learn val one and val two. We learn these new variables val one prime and val two prime, and we learn that val one prime plus val two prime equals zero. Uh, we'll get back to this later. It's not important for now. For now, we just want to update these variables. So what I will do is, uh, but what, what the tactics will do is a bunch of manipulation to combine the two halves of the ghost variable together. As I said, you can add up these two halves and you get a full fraction one. Now that we have a full fraction one, we can change the value of this ghost variable. And that's exactly what I do here. Um, and I do two, two things simultaneously. Uh, actually, why don't I do this slower? Here, I just update the ghost variable. Um, and now in a separate step, I'm going to split it using that rule that I just said, where you can take a fraction and you can split it into two halves. So what I've done is I've updated this variable. I've split it into two halves. Um, I'm going to do the same treatment to the other ghost variable. I'm going to update split to now both of the logical balances uh, are updated correctly. And now, now, we're just, now we've done all the updates that we wanted to do, and we just have to close everything up. So what do we need to close? Um, you can see that the goal has this bank in, ignore the triangle for now. Uh, actually, just ignore the triangle, it's not important. Um, we need to reprove that the invariant holds. Um, of course, this is necessary because we said this, we claimed this was an invariant, so we can't just access its contents willy-nilly. We have to make sure that it still holds. Uh, and that's a non-trivial statement because the invariant is what says that the balances add up to zero. So I'm going to start proving that the bank invariant holds. Um, there are two parts to this, right? So the invariant has ownership of both balances, and it says that the balances add up to zero. The ownership part is really simple. I'm just going to give back half of each of the ghost variables. Iframe will just do that for me, um, although very slowly for some reason. OK, so I gave back the ownership, but I still have to prove that the sum of the balances is 0. This is the crux of the whole argument, right? So. You can't just open these, you can't just acquire these locks and update the balances however you want. We have to actually do it in this balanced fashion where we subtract from one and add to the other. Otherwise, this invariant will be false. Um, the reason why it's true is because it was true for the original balances, val one and val two, and we made the same change to both. This is just arithmetic reasoning, and we let Leah prove it. So that covered the entire. Uh, that covered a, uh, all the logical steps for transfer, right? So recall, like, uh, taking a step back, we acquired both locks. We did all the physical stuff that we needed to do. We actually updated both balances. And then the crux of transfer is that we don't update the logical balances until we're done updating both physical balances. Then we update both logical balances atomically in the same step. Um, we can do this atomically because they're ghost steps now and not physical steps. Ghost steps can always happen together. Now that we've done that, we can release both locks. Um, and these locks, the only thing that these locks are requiring us to prove is that the logical balances actually match the physical balances. So if we had skipped that complicated step where we opened the invariant, we wouldn't be able to uh, release both locks. Um, because we did, it's really simple. This is very simple ownership transfer. And that finishes off the proof of transfer. So what have we really accomplished here? What we've proven is that the invariants of the bank are not violated. And because they're not violated, we know something about check consistency. Um, OK, I'm going to return to, actually, are there any questions that while I'm at the code? Because it's a little annoying to switch back.
Okay, I'm going to spend a little bit of time wrapping up. Um, the wrap up that I want to do in particular is uh, this is kind of a small example in some ways, uh, right? So this is just, oh, sorry, I meant to give you a chance to talk about the invariant. Okay, we might have to skip that. I don't think this is the right time to do that. Um, because I do want to spend some time wrapping up um, by covering what we didn't talk about here. So I just want to mention what we didn't talk about here. So what we saw was an example of using lock invariants and some very simple ghost state. Uh, Iris has more complicated ghost state than what you saw. This is why the blog post has this authoritative stuff, which is more complicated than, um, that seemed more complicated than necessary. So in Iris, there's actually pretty sophisticated machinery for writing your own ghost state. Just, I'm just gonna give you a very small taste of this, which is we, we can define ghost state, which uh, maintains a monotonic counter, okay? So it's gonna have two parts. Um, we can, so this, G, this uh, gamma is just the name of this variable. Uh, we have a proposition m not own off, which says the counter is exactly this sub, this counter named gamma um, is exactly n. And then the cool thing about the monotonic counter is that we also have another statement that says the counter's value is at least m. And because we're going to make we're going to make this counter monotonically increasing, which means that we're only going to increase or, or keep this value the same for this counter. What that means is that this fact is actually going to be persistent. So any thread, once it learns that the counter is at least m, it knows that this is true forever, and all other threads can know this fact. Um, I don't have a good example of where you might incorporate this. Um, but you can see that um, what this this is more powerful than the ghost state we saw in our examples. In our examples, the ghost state was all exclusive, and so we had to put it inside locks and protect it, and we had to put it um, inside invariants. Uh, this kind of ghost state, once you get this lower bound, uh, you can share it with other threads freely, um, and you don't have to protect this lower bound resource. Um, Maybe more impressively, uh, invariance as well as uh, lock invariance are also defined using user-defined ghost state. So the fact that's that invariant fact that I used uh, to say that the ghost state actually added up to zero, that invariant fact itself is defined using ghost state. Um, it's definitely the most sophisticated ghost state in all of Iris, uh, but it's still cool that the library doesn't actually have this built in. It's defined essentially in the standard library. The, the language doesn't have this built in, it's in the library. Okay, so this is, this is one thing that distinguishes Iris from Armada. So in Armada, ghost variables are not very extensible. Uh, and we can't say, if you want to prove that some counter is only increasing, you have to do that using a refinement proof. There's no other way. Uh, one thing that you might have noticed is that in the uh, Armada proof, we actually showed that transfer is an atomic operation. Um, and that's actually kind of a nice thing to prove. Like maybe for other reasons, we might want to know that transfer is atomic, not just that it, this consistency check succeeds. So it is possible in Iris to uh, specify and prove uh, the actual atomicity and refinement of a library. Um, so you can do what you do in Armada, which is to prove that transfer is atomic. And after you do that, you can actually do this proof without the machinery that I described here. Uh, once transfer is atomic, you can just make it an invariant that, on top of that, you can make it an invariant that the balance is up to zero. Um, Finally, I want to just leave you with one slightly complicated thing that you can do, uh, which is quite a bit more sophisticated than what you can do in Armada. 
So in our model, recall that you can prove that this program meets this specification. There's a little bit of a digression, but um, one of the very impressive projects accomplished with IRIS is a proof of semantic type safety for Rust. Um, this is part of the Rust Belt project. So what is semantic type safety? The idea is um, in Rust, there's a, bunch of, there's a bunch of code which uses the Rust type system to prove um, the, the Rust type system guarantees that this code is free of data races and that uh, you don't have memory errors, right? You have type safety, which means that you're not going to access pointers out of bounds. Um, that kind of uh, memory, it guarantees those memory safety, guarantees it um, at least. But you can't write everything that you want to in Rust. Sometimes you need to write things with unsafe code. So um, as an example, uh, there's a, a vec, uh, there's, there's a, a, a class called a, a vector in Rust. Uh, this is a lot like a C++ vector. It's a dynamically growing, uh, it, it's backed by an array. Um, it has a, a pointer, a length, and a capacity. Um, every time the uh, vector runs out of space, it, copy, it, it doubles its size and it copies over and it has some reserve capacity to be efficient, right? So this is probably something you've seen in data structures. Um, it's a very common data structure to have. Now, VEC is not actually, cannot be written in safe Rust. So VEC is instead written in unsafe Rust, okay? So this has to do some raw pointer manipulation that can't be written in safe Rust. Um, when, when you write this in unsafe Rust, the goal of Rust is that if you use VEC, you have a safe API to VEC. So you don't have to use unsafe Rust to use VEC. You only have to use unsafe to implement VEC. And the idea of Rust Belt is we want to show what does it mean for VEC to be safe in the sense that all its callers, um, its unsafe implementation is correctly implemented so that anybody using VEC, as long as they write safe code, they're not going to run into bugs. Okay, So they should also have safety. In other words, what proof obligations does Rust impose on a developer of the VEC library to guarantee that VEC is actually safe? And the way that this is actually done in Rust is, in Rust Belt is quite complicated. Um, but the basic intuition is that we are going to translate types in Rust to predicates in Iris that say, what does it mean to have an object of that type? So the simplest example is, um, let's say we have box u64. Box u64 is, uh, you can imagine it's just like a pointer to, uh, it's a boxed u64, it's a pointer to a u64. What you can imagine that one thing that happens, so this thing is gonna be a function which translates a rust, this is gonna be a rust type and we're going to translate it to uh, a iris proposition that says, what does it mean to have a value of type t? And for example, what it means to have a box u64 is you have um, some pointer and so, so sorry, actually. So what this thing says is, uh, this is going to be a Rust value. And it's going to say, what does it mean for x to, for x to be of type t? And it's going to say this by owning some facts. So for example, box of u64, um, we're going to say that this is ownership of some v, where v is a u64. So the point that I wanted to make with this is that we actually use this points to fact as the interpretation of what it means to have a box. And the proof, um, when we prove the, the obligation that we're gonna get from VEC is gonna be computed by this uh, these, these double bracket things. Um, 
and the the proof obligation is going to be some iprop. It's going to be some some a bunch of uh, a bunch of iris uh, uh, proper. It's going to be a bunch of iris proofs about the implementation of Vec. Um, so sorry, this is a, like necessarily a very brief explanation of Rust Belt, um, but I think the thing the thing to take away is that we can use Iris to prove the internal safety of VEC in a way that shows that anybody using VEC um, is going to, anybody using VEC safely is going to also have safe code. Um, that is all I have. I'm happy to take some questions. All right, if there are no questions, then we will see you all on Thursday uh, where we're talking about Ironfleet. <laughs>